Item number, SCP-003. Object class, Euclid. Special containment procedures. SCP-003 is to be maintained at a constant temperature of no less than 35 degrees Celsius and ideally kept above 100 degrees Celsius. No living multicellular organisms of category 4 or higher complexity may be allowed to come into contact with SCP-003. In event of total power failure, if SCP-003-1 begins to increase its mass, assigned personnel must engage in skin contact with SCP-003-1. Ideally, personnel may use their body heat to return SCP-003-1 to above the critical temperature. However, skin contact must be maintained even in event of SCP-003 reaching activation temperature, lasting at minimum until SCP-003-1 advances fully to its second growth stage. Personnel who enter SCP-003's containment area must first be examined for body parasites of Category 4 or higher complexity and sterilized if such organisms are present. All personnel who have come in physical contact with SCP-003-1 are to immediately report for sterilization afterwards. SCP-003-1 must not be removed from SCP-003-2, except in case of emergency procedures detailed above. Any significant change in SCP-003-2's rune activity, including pattern, frequency, or color, should be reported within three hours of occurrence. Cessation of rune activity must be reported immediately. SCP-003-2 must be supplied with power via the source designated generator 003-9 at all times. Description: SCP-003 consists of two related components of separate origin, referred to as SCP-003-1 and SCP-003-2. SCP-003-1 appears to be composed of chitin hair, and nails of unknown biology, arranged in a configuration similar to that of a computer motherboard. Testing reveals SCP-003-1 to predate earliest known circuit boards by a factor of thousands of years. SCP-003-1 is considered sentient, but not actively dangerous except under certain conditions. SCP-003-1 was found on a stone tablet. SCP-003-2 on which it currently resides. The runes on SCP-003-2 are not part of any known language and emit pale, flickering light patterns. SCP-003-2 is controlled by a non-biological internal computer, the contents of which are mostly inaccessible without risk of damaging SCP-003-2. SCP-003-2 is capable of controlled emissions of radiation, including heat, light, and anomalous radiation types. SCP-003-2 contains an internal power source of an anomalous nature, which appears to have been losing power since several centuries before discovery. It is considered probable that SCP-003-2 was created for the purpose of containing SCP-003-1. Partially interpreted data recovered from SCP-003-2 may refer to a past and or potential future LK-class restructuring event caused by SCP-003-1. SCP-003 was located by remote viewing team SRV-04 Beta. It appears possible that SRV-04 Beta was deliberately contacted by SCP-003-2. Other organizations have also been alerted to SCP-003's existence, possibly by similar means. Despite this activity, SCP-003-2 does not appear to be sentient based on its lack of reaction to M-03 Gloria analysis and procedures. When SCP-003 drops below the temperature of 35 degrees Celsius, both components react. First, SCP-003-1 enters a growth state characterized by an exponential increase in mass. This growth state consists of two stages. In both stages, SCP-003-1 partially fuels its growth by converting matter around it, starting with any surrounding inorganic material, including atmospheric elements, then non-living organic material, including cells of dead skin, hair, chitin, enamel, keratin, and other biological materials. The first stage is always the same. 
SCP-003-1 will first increase its mass, then take a form similar in shape to an ophioroid, brittle star of 15 meters in diameter, including what appears to be a central processor of 3 meters in diameter. It will form sensory organs that appear to scan its surrounding environment, and will partially convert the area around it to an unidentified anomalous substance. SCP-003-2 seems immune from conversion. The second stage describes a growth alteration which occurs when SCP-003 comes into contact with living organic material. SCP-003 appears to template itself off of the organic material and will attempt communication with organisms that match its initial template or templates. In its second stage, SCP-003-1 may pause, slow, or change its growth then will also convert inorganic and non-living organic elements into functionally similar structures, while anomalously altering their physical makeup. While growth is consistent in the first stage, in the second stage SCP-003-1's growth rate is diminished by 20 to 90 percent, so long as SCP-003-1 remains in contact with living organic material. The percentage is determined by the complexity of the organisms in contact with SCP-003-1. SCP-003-1 appears to devote a large amount of processing power to analysis of living organic material. During each of SCP-003-1's growth stages, SCP-003-2 releases bursts of radiation that temporarily inhibit SCP-003-1's growth, or reverse this growth when the temperature of SCP-003-1 rises above 100 degrees Celsius. Similar radiation emissions have been replicated or recorded via other anomalous means. SCP-003-1's biology has been the subject of extensive study. Significant elements have been identified similar to SCP-1512 SCP and SCP-2756, the latter two of which have no further confirmed connection with SCP-003-1 and no known connection with each other, and none of which are fully understood. Technically, even less understood than SCP-003, thanks to the extensive cross-disciplinary research on the SCP-003 objects. To date, no convincing analysis has been put forward which satisfactorily explains SCP-003-1's connection to these SCP objects or others, nor its connection to modern technology beyond appearance and potential mimicry via unknown mechanism. Addendum 003-01 Acting on information gathered from linguistic analysis of SCP-003-2's runes and comparative data analysis, research team M03 Gloria has managed to establish a link between SCP-003 and data expunged for analysis of functions. SCP-003-1 must now be considered sentient and is to be kept a minimum of one kilometer from data expunged and the resulting byproduct at all times. Addendum 003-02 SCP-003-2's power loss has been exacerbated by the procedures performed by M03 Gloria. On orders of 0510, M03 Gloria will continue procedures. Addendum 003-03 During M03 Gloria procedures, SCP-003-1 doubled its mass and began rapid structural growth. Temperature was immediately returned to 100 degrees Celsius. Growth and mass increase of SCP-003-1 continued for 9 minutes and 6 seconds, at which time a sustained radiation spike was produced by SCP-003-2. In response, SCP-003-1 returned to its normal state in 3 minutes and 39 seconds. New growth dissolved into a dusty residue which was collected for analysis. Both SCP-003-1 and SCP-003-2 ceased all detectable activity. SCP-003-2 did not resume activity until connected to an external power source. SCP-003-2's runes glowed uniformly gray and did not resume normal activity for three hours. SCP-003-2 no longer appears to be able to maintain containment area at a temperature above 35 degrees Celsius without external power supplied by generator 003-3 through 9. Addendum 003-04 
The procedure detailed in Addendum 003-03 was repeated, and SCP-003-1 again entered a growth state. After 10 minutes and 13 seconds, SCP-003-2 once again produced a sustained radiation spike. SCP-003-1's growth stopped for 36 seconds, then resumed at its previous pace. On quadrupling its mass, SCP-003-1 formed a coherent outer shell and body. After appearing to scan its environment and partially converting its environment, SCP-003-1 then breached containment, entering the observation gallery where nine members of M-03 Gloria were present. On physical contact with team members, SCP-003-1 encompassed them in rapidly grown appendages and stopped growth for 15 minutes. SCP-003-1 then resumed growth and rearranged the component parts of the center of its form to the shape of a three-meter-tall female humanoid, with peripheral tentacles shifting to extrude primarily from SCP-003-1's newly formed hair and spine. SCP-003-1 then produced rudimentary vocalizations in an apparent initial attempt to communicate with researchers. Data expunged. An unknown individual approached the compromised containment area in company of a full squad of agents. The individual claimed to be acting on orders of 0510 and attempted communication with SCP-003-1. Data expunged. Following this incident, Agent Jackson of M-03 Gloria successfully restored power to SCP-003-2 and activated backup generators to return the temperature to 100 degrees Celsius. SCP-003-1 returned to its normal state in 21 minutes and 7 seconds, and was successfully recontained without incident. All nine members of M-03 Gloria affected by SCP-003-1 were afterwards found to be physically unharmed, with no residual effects besides psychological trauma. The converted materials of SCP-003's former containment area did not dissolve and are now under analysis. Addendum 003-05 In light of the previous incident, 0510 was removed from the 05 Council by joint decision of 05 05 and 05 M03 Gloria procedures have been indefinitely suspended. Special Access Program M03 Gloria required Transcript of Incident Report A21B Cycle 8 for dissemination to O5 command and staff. Interviewers. And present. O5-2, O5-5, O5-7, O5-10, and staff. Interviewed. Dr. Tilda David Moose, M03 Gloria Lead. Excerpt 35A. She tried to talk to us. We all heard her voice in our heads in a sort of half language we couldn't fully understand. Some of the others passed out immediately. I lasted a little longer, but it wasn't because of mental fortitude. It's just that she was trying to tell us different things. She showed Jones a replay of all the memories of everything Jones ever felt anything about, all over the course of a few minutes. She ripped three of the researchers apart and put them back together unharmed. She doesn't understand human emotion or pain or very much about how we experience the world. Yes, I would say the containment procedures are necessary. Listen, she wants to remake the world into a paradise. A paradise filtered through her own alien understanding of paradise, but still, a paradise designed for us, for humanity. She would be happy to make a paradise for any sufficiently complex organism she comes across first. Anything with a complex enough mind to accept her say, a dog, or a housefly. If she breaches again, we have to be there first. What would it be like? I don't know. She showed us images. Not quite images. I can see them in my head, but they're not pictures. The closest thing I can think of is what you see when you close your eyes suddenly and tightly, but brighter and more complex. The images had metallic sounds associated with them, and sensory details that we don't have the words or concepts to describe. The whole effect felt like words of some kind. I believe she wanted to see what we could understand, so she could understand us. She didn't have time to finish analyzing us. 
I don't know what would have happened if she had. Item number, SCP-035, Object Class, Keter. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-035 is to be kept within a hermetically sealed glass case, no fewer than 10 centimeters, 4 inches thick. This case is to be contained within a steel, iron, and lead shielded room at all times. Doors are to be triple locked at all times, with the exception of allowing personnel in or out. No fewer than two armed guards are to be posted at any time. Guards must remain outside at all times, and are not allowed within the containment room under any circumstances. A trained psychologist is to remain on site at all times. Research personnel are not to touch SCP-035 at any time. SCP-035 must be moved to a new sealed case every two weeks. The previous case must be disposed of via SCP-101, as it shows no adverse reactions to SCP-035's corruption. Anyone who comes into contact with SCP-035 when it is in possession of a host is to be given an immediate psychological evaluation. Description SCP-035 appears to be a white porcelain comedy mask, although, at times, it will change to tragedy. In these events, all existing visual records, such as photographs, video footage, even illustrations of SCP-035 automatically change to reflect its new appearance. A highly corrosive and degenerative viscous liquid constantly seeps from the eye and mouth holes of SCP-035. Anything coming into contact with this substance slowly decays over a period of time, depending on the material, until it has decayed completely into a pool of the original contaminant. Glass seems to react the slowest to the effects of the item, hence the construction choice of its immediate container. Living organisms that come into contact with the substance react much the same way, with no chance of recovery. Origin of the liquid is unknown. Liquid is only visible from the front, and does not emerge or is even visible from the other side. Subjects within 1.5 to 2 meters, 5 or 6 feet, of SCP-035, or in visual contact with it, experience a strong urge to put it on. When SCP-035 is placed on the face of an individual, an alternate brainwave pattern from SCP-035 overlaps that of the original host, effectively snuffing it out and causing brain death to the subject. Subject then claims to be the consciousness contained within SCP-035. The bodies of possessed subjects decay at a highly accelerated rate, eventually becoming little more than mummified corpses. Nevertheless, SCP-035 has demonstrated the ability to remain in cognitive control of a body, experiencing severe structural damage, even if the subject's body literally decays to the point where motion is not mechanically possible. No effect is found to be had when placed on the face of an animal. Conversations with SCP-035 have proven to be informative. Researchers have learned various details about other SCP objects and history in general, as SCP-035 claims to have been at many momentous events. SCP-035 displays a highly intelligent and charismatic personality, being both amiable and flattering to all those who speak with it. SCP-035 has scored in the 99th percentile on all intelligence and aptitude tests administered to it and appears to have a photographic memory. However, psychological analysis has discovered SCP-035 to possess a highly manipulative nature, capable of forcing sudden and profound changes to interviewers' psychological state. SCP-035 has proven to be highly sadistic, prompting some to commit suicide and transforming others into near-mindless servants with linguistic persuasion alone. SCP-035 has stated that it has intimate knowledge of the workings of the human mind, and implied that it could change anyone's views if given enough time. Additional Notes SCP-035 was found in a sealed crypt in an abandoned house in Venice, in 18... Addendum 035-01 SCP-035 has been found to be able to possess anything that has a humanoid shape, including mannequins, corpses, and statues. SCP-035 has been able to motivate all into movement, removing the need to expose live subjects to SCP-035. Still, 
anything it possesses inevitably decays into motionlessness. Addendum 035-02 SCP-035 has facilitated an escape attempt, convincing several of the research staff to aid it in its bid for freedom. Insurrection failed. All staff that have been in contact with SCP-035 have been terminated, and mandatory psychiatric evaluations have been implemented for all personnel coming in contact with SCP-035. Addendum 035-03 It has been determined that SCP-035 is capable of telepathy, whether or not it possesses a host, even penetrating to the subconscious of others and using the knowledge it finds to its advantage. Extreme caution is advised when choosing subjects to converse with SCP-035. Addendum 035-04 SCP-035 has expressed an interest in other SCPs, most notably SCP-4715 and SCP-682. Dr. has expressed worry that should SCP-035 bond with either, their regenerative qualities would negate its corruption and give it a permanent host. Addendum 035-05 After several more escape attempts, and after reviewing SCP-035's incident record, High Command has ordered that it be permanently sealed within the facility and prohibited from being allowed any more hosts. Several personnel have protested against this, with some even erupting into violence. As a direct result, all personnel that have come into contact with SCP-035 have been terminated. Going forward, all personnel that deal with SCP-035 are to be rotated frequently, and contact is to be limited even to its dormant state to as little as possible. Addendum 035-06 Personnel within 10 meters of SCP-035 have recently reported feeling unease, stating that they can hear unintelligible whispering. Several others have suffered from severe migraines. Object has been monitored, but there is no change in its dormant behavior, and no sounds have been recorded. The motion to reinstate SCP-035's host privileges has been brought up once more, if only on a temporary basis, to discover these new changes in the object's behavior. Denied. Addendum 035-07 The walls of SCP-035's containment cell have suddenly begun secreting a black substance. Tests on the substance have revealed it to be human blood, although highly contaminated with several foreign and unknown agents. Substance is corrosive, having a pH balance of 4.5, and prolonged exposure to the walls has proven to be detrimental to their structural integrity. More notably, it seems to be forming patterns on the walls. Several segments seem to be paragraphs in various languages, including Italian, Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit. Translation is pending. Other segments appear to be diagrams depicting ritualistic sacrifice and mutilation, often for the arcane benefit of the person committing them. Several staff members have been shocked to note that all of the sacrifices bear an uncanny resemblance to various personnel and their loved ones, often in conflicting positions. Researchers while in the room examining these newly formed patterns have complained of hearing loud whispering and high-pitched, unnerving laughter at irregular intervals. Personnel in the section working daily near and around SCP-035's containment unit have suffered catastrophic morale damage, with an all-time high in suicide rates in staff in that area, whether or not they have ever had contact with SCP-035. The only change in SCP-035's dormant behavior is regarding its contained glass case. Degradation of the case has increased to a high degree, enough so that the glass will occasionally shatter causing a wide dispersal of SCP-035's contaminant. This occurs quite often at the most inopportune times, so far resulting in six casualties and three fatalities of both research and cleanup staff. Addendum 035-08 In light of the mass suicide and homicide of the members of the research team tasked with translating the passages garnered from SCP-035's containment cell, the morale damage in the area and general loss of staff dealing with SCP-035 to either death or insanity, it has been decided to coat the inner and outer walls of its containment cell with SCP-148, which has proved well in the containment of SCP-132, 
in order to hopefully block out the high levels of negativity being emitted by SCP-035. Addendum 035-09 The use of SCP-148 has worked well, causing morale and suicide rates to return to near pre-SCP-035 rates. However, the material appears to facilitate the negativity within the cell, causing a veritable greenhouse effect inside. Personnel inside the cell have stated that they feel a heavy sense of dread, fear, anger, and general depression, as well as hearing constant, nearly inaudible whispering upon immediate entry. A prolonged stay causes severe migraines, suicidal tendencies, heavy hemorrhaging of blood vessels around the eyes and inside the mouth and nose, general hostility to others, and for the whispering to increase to almost deafening volumes, intersected by a constant mocking laughter. Exposure of more than three hours inevitably results in the subject falling into a deep psychosis and attempting to harm either themselves or others. Most spoke in Latin or Greek, despite the fact that several did not previously know how to speak said languages beforehand. The presence of blood in both word and diagram formations has increased disproportionately, the walls becoming cluttered and the formations beginning to overlap each other. The substance has proven to be both difficult to clean and even more corrosive than was originally recorded, with a pH of roughly 2.4. General estimation gives the current walls a life of two months before they will need replacement. It is becoming gradually more and more difficult to contain SCP-035, and the debate to reinstate its host privileges has once again come up. Denied. Addendum 035-10 The walls, ceiling, and floor of SCP-035's containment cell have now been completely saturated in blood. All personnel entering and guarding the area must wear full hazmat protection suits. Constant cleaning efforts are being instated. Addendum 035-11 The magnitude, intensity, and recurrence of the phenomena that occur within SCP-035's containment cell have increased to an alarming degree. The cell door has been known to become locked of its own accord while personnel are inside and unable to be opened for a period of time. Appendages form out of the larger puddles of blood and often attempt to grab or harm personnel near them. Blurry apparitions have started appearing to staff. Electronic devices no longer work inside the cell and the light cannot be turned on, though there is no physical reason why it does not work, forcing those entering to use non-electric based light sources. Cleaning measures are having no discernible effect on the cell, and the walls are degrading at a very high rate, forcing them to be replaced within a week at best, although the blood makes it nearly impossible to properly achieve this. SCP-035 may have to be moved to a new cell entirely, with the old one sealed off and disengaged from the rest of the facility. Item Number SCP-041 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-041 is to be hospitalized at Bioresearch Area 12. Though not Keter class, should SCP-041's abilities ever propagate beyond a reasonably containable area, the risk of SCP-sensitive information being broadcast to the public remains too great a risk and warrants area-level isolation away from the general populace. SCP personnel wanting to keep their thoughts private are advised to remain outside of a 15-meter radius from SCP-041 beyond the designated red circle on the floor. It is beneficial to the mental health of SCP-041 to have a sitter in the room who watches television and concentrates on its programming. This allows SCP-041 to effectively watch television through the mind of someone else. The optimal sitter is a Class D personnel with below average intelligence whose mind does not wander or have more than one train of thought at a time, though not mind control. SCP-041 has used its abilities to coerce sitters into watching programming that they don't themselves enjoy. SCP-041's tastes vary between gore and slasher films, having even expressed interest in snuff and children's programming. Description: SCP-041 is a male human suffering from irreversible damage to his central nervous system, which is believed to have been caused by an infection of a rare strain of bacterial meningitis. Although antibiotics were successful in clearing the infection, the membranes surrounding his brain and spinal cord had reacted to the infection by severing many neurons connecting the central nervous system to the rest of the body. 
SCP-041 must rely on a respirator to sustain his breathing, a biventricular pacemaker to keep his heart beating, and a nasogastric tube to provide nutrition. Visually, SCP-041 appears to be in a persistent vegetative state. However, observers in the presence of SCP-041 begin to realize that their thoughts, along with everyone else's in about a 10 meter radius from SCP-041, are broadcast in a semi-audible fashion. Aside from being the source, SCP-041 is also capable of broadcasting his own thoughts to those present. Anyone forming an idea using words will have those thoughts unwillingly transmitted to others in this range as mind-audible speech, which cannot be recorded by any known equipment. Mind-audible speech may be heard using whatever voice a subject chooses to think with. Most typically, this is the subject's normal voice. Visual thoughts and images are broadcast as well, but are not received as readily. Images are most effectively transmitted when both the sender and receiver have their eyes closed. The sender concentrates on a single object without environment or background, and the receiver's mind is clear of conscious thoughts. Communication between subjects using visual images, particularly those not rooted in memory but in imagination, is usually difficult. The sender typically has trouble conceiving a highly detailed mental object from a single point of view, while the receiver will often try to fill in gaps of missing information, ultimately resulting in the receiver seeing a different image from what was sent. The most difficult imagery to be successfully broadcast appears to be a person's face, particularly if the image is one of a person in motion. Although able to transmit his thoughts to others, SCP-041 is not very talkative. Attempts to persuade SCP-041 to divulge any information about his abilities have been so far fruitless. SCP-041 is typically silent and normally will not respond to any direct attempts at communication. However, SCP-041 appears to have a sense of humor as he interjects occasional comments into conversations of others. Addendum 01 While researcher was taking voice notes using a digital audio recorder, a fellow researcher was changing the television in SCP-041's room. While the television was on a channel of static, disembodied voices could be heard filtered through the white noise. Attempts to record mind-audible speech with white noise generators and sound recording equipment have begun to yield modest results, though most audio is garbled, and recorded sounds may or may not be voices and are widely left toward individual interpretations. Addendum 2 it has come to my attention that several personnel have used SCP-041 as an ad hoc, she likes me, she likes me not detector. This is one of the most appalling things I've ever heard. Are we safeguarding potentially world-destroying objects, or are we in third grade? Dr. Klein. Document 1, researchers quote, You know, the first time I was in that room with Kent in 41, I kept hearing this singing. It was this little girl's voice singing some kid's song. It wasn't the TV, and it definitely wasn't a radio. It was in our heads, you know? So I think, you know, if I was stuck in bed, without anything else to do, I'd sing like a little girl too. And then this voice comes into my head. Hey, it's not me. I don't know that tune. And then old Kent looks at me, gone all white in the face, you know? Note. This event occurred after SCP-239 was placed in a chemically induced coma. Any connection between the two SCPs is currently unconfirmed. Item Number SCP-069 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-069 is currently impersonating former Foundation agent and is housed at Humanoid Containment Site 06-3. SCP-069 is to be provided with any reasonable requested item and or material, so long as such request does not violate Foundation security protocols. Special containment procedures have been modified. The following now applies. As SCP-069 is currently on suicide watch, all requests it makes must be approved by no fewer than two Level 3 personnel. If SCP-069 attempts to breach containment, it must be subdued using non-lethal methods. If SCP-069 dies, undercover agents are to be instructed to monitor reports of incidents in which individuals appear to have escaped certain death, and SCP-069 is to be recontained as soon as possible. Note, despite the fact that SCP-069 is identical in all ways to said agent, it remains an active SCP in containment. 
and is not to be treated as a Foundation employee. Any requests for classified information are to be denied, and visits from former co-workers without proper authorization are not allowed. Description SCP-069 is a presumed humanoid entity, a variable appearance in gender. Through an unknown ability, whenever SCP-069 is left alone with a recently deceased human body, the body will disappear, and SCP-069 will take on the appearance, mannerisms, and knowledge of the recently dead individual. Through extensive experimentation, it has been shown that SCP-069 is completely indistinguishable from the individual it impersonates, matching the original individual's fingerprints, DNA, and data expunged with nearly perfect precision. SCP-069 retains no knowledge of its abilities or former impersonations. SCP-069 responds normally to injury and pain, but if killed, will rapidly decay into dust regardless of any preservation attempts. SCP-069 will then re-emerge at the site of the most recent human death. There is no known maximum range to this effect, and so far has been observed in jumps of up to 675 kilometers. SCP-069 can impersonate a single individual indefinitely. However, it will gain an overriding urge to get their life in order, including but not limited to resolving any outstanding financial or personal obligations, visiting extended family, updating their will and testament, and other acts of closure. When questioned, SCP-069 professes no driving motivation other than a desire to straighten out their lives in the event of unforeseen injury or death. SCP-069 first came to the Foundation's attention in 1991 following reports of one John M., a firefighter who miraculously emerged alive from a three-alarm building fire in which two other firefighters and 11 civilians perished. Undercover agents attached to the local authorities were notified of a possible SCP when reports emerged that the firefighter's equipment had been damaged beyond recognition and that it had been deemed nearly impossible for the firefighter to emerge unscathed. Approximately three weeks later, then-presumed John M. responded to another large-scale building fire, during which he entered a smoke-filled room alone and was never found. A single civilian was rescued from the building, again nearly unharmed, despite the heavy smoke reported within the building. SCP-069 was designated the following day and rendered into Foundation custody by members of Mobile Task Force Xi-3, Body Snatchers. Addendum 069-1 In 2000, Agent a guard on duty assigned to SCP-069, was killed during the containment breach of SCP- and subsequently impersonated by SCP-069. Although initially in denial after being formed of its identity, it has been mostly cooperative since its impersonation of a mid-level Foundation employee. Contingencies for the use of deceased Foundation employees for future SCP-069 use is under consideration. Addendum 069-2 In 2000, SCP-069 attempted to commit suicide after a junior researcher accidentally informed it that the family of Agent had been told that said agent was dead and of their subsequent reactions. Due to the massive cost of possibly having to recontain SCP-069, Strict suicide watch measures are to be implemented. Plans to use other deceased Foundation employees as possible impersonation targets for SCP-069 have been suspended. Item Number SCP-071 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-071 is contained in a modified standard humanoid containment cell with no direct observation capabilities. Surveillance of SCP-071 may only be performed via closed-circuit video, with a minimum of 60 seconds of delay. Experimentation with SCP-071 may only be performed with permission from at least two Level 4 Site Directors, and personnel entering SCP-071's containment area may only do so in groups of at least four. Any personnel exhibiting unusual or compulsive behavior must be removed from the area immediately, given a full psychiatric screening and either administered a Class C amnestic or reassigned as deemed appropriate. Under no circumstances should personnel be permitted to observe SCP-071 directly or through non-delayed surveillance footage. All visual recordings and photographs of SCP-071 must be destroyed immediately once they are no longer needed. 
Description SCP-071 is a metamorphic entity that possesses the ability to assume forms consistent with that of its observer's strongest sexual desire. This ability is effective even through barriers designed to prevent SCP-071's recognition of any observers, such as through closed-circuit surveillance or one-way mirrors, but can be prevented by introducing a delay in surveillance footage, so that such observation does not occur in real time. SCP-071 appears to be unable or unwilling to change form without external stimuli, instead remaining in its last form when left unobserved. There appears to be little or no limit to the forms SCP-071 is capable of assuming. SCP-071 also appears to be intelligent, however, as it has not shown any ability to verbally communicate, and its behavior is limited to actions which entice its observers to sexual activity. It is unknown whether SCP-071 actually possesses sentience, or merely mimics behavior expected by its observers. Human subjects allowed to engage in sexual activity with SCP-071 suffered rapid atrophy of muscle, skeletal structure, and brain function, with onset occurring one to two days after contact. The atrophy persists for up to seven days, dependent on physical therapy administered after onset though the subject may also suffer permanent decrease in stature, decreased organ function, decreased brain mass, and sterility. Subjects who achieve auto-gratification through masturbation, via the use of media containing SCP-071, whether delayed or not, suffer the same effects. SCP-071 came to the Foundation's attention on following data expunged. Due to ongoing medical cases consistent with exposure to SCP-071, Efforts to remove all visual recordings of SCP-071 from the internet are ongoing. Addendum 071-1 Researcher Note SCP-071's ability to change forms does not appear to be limited to normal human subjects. When presented with subject D-7883, SCP-071 assumed the shape of a female golden retriever. D-7883 reacted with shock and refused to proceed with the experiment though the subject's physiological signs were consistent with a state of sexual arousal. On SCP-071 assumed the form of a female human corpse when exposed to D-8762. Medical staff confirmed a complete lack of life signs, and SCP-071 suffered no harm from the transition, later assuming the form of a year old male subject when exposed to D-8765. Dr. Item number. SCP-117 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-117 is to be kept in the small leather pouch it was found in, unless in use or in current study. Any personnel deemed mentally fit may enter the containment cell of the SCP, though if they are suspected to be trying to remove the SCP without permission, they are to be searched, and if that is the case, they are to be reprimanded. The door to the containment cell should remain locked, and a guard posted only when the object is in use. Description The item appears to be a regular multi-tool, of unknown make and brand, found in Florida. At first glance, only the normal tools are found, screwdriver, knife, can opener, etc. But if the user is faced with a task, regardless of what tool the subject intends to pull out and use, a tool perfectly fitted for the job will take its place regardless of spatial quantities that are being broken by the tool. All other tools always seem to be present, though, after the task is completed and the tool closed, unless faced with a task requiring that tool again, the tool cannot be found on the tool again. Addendum Document number 117A Effects of Usage After countless uses and testing with the SCP, it has been discovered to cause harm and possibly death to the user by means of absorbing iron copper, calcium, and zinc from the user's body as long as the user is touching the device. Gloves seem to have no curbing effect on this, and the rate of absorption seems to depend on the tools used or created by SCP-117. It is advised that only Class D personnel are used in conjunction with this SCP to prevent death or injury of researchers. Document number 117-B Usage Log of SCP-117 Redundant Entries Not Entered unless they exhibit different results. Situation A loose screw on a metal plate. Tool produced by SCP. Screwdriver, though not the standard screwdriver. 
Situation. A nail, barely in piece of timber. Tool produced by SCP. Standard hammer. Situation. A piece of timber with proposed cut lines drawn. Tool produced by SCP. An electric saw, which needed no outside power source. Situation. A piece of bulletproof glass. Tool produced by SCP. An unknown laser cutting tool, which needed no outside power source. Situation. SCP. Tool produced by SCP. A bloodied combat knife. Situation. An agent with a broken bone. Tool produced by SCP. A small item with a trigger, which when pulled emitted an odd radiation, instantly healing the injury. Situation. Class D personnel fit for execution. Tool produced by SCP. Data expunged. Situation. Communication needed with SCP-363. Tool produced by SCP. Data expunged. Situation. A non-shuffled deck of playing cards. Tool produced by SCP. A mid-size mechanical shuffler. Situation. Class D personnel with terminal cancer. Tool produced by SCP. Item similar to sixth test. Situation. A perfectly healthy Caucasian human male with no criminal record. Tool produced by SCP. Data expunged. Situation. A perfectly healthy Hispanic human male with no criminal record. Tool produced by SCP. Data expunged. Situation. A silver dinner fork in perfect condition. Tool produced by SCP. No tools could be found on the SCP. Situation. Data expunged. Tool produced by SCP. A screwdriver. Situation. A dirty window. Tool produced by SCP. A nozzle that sprayed a mixture of soap and water that completely cleaned the window. Situation. An uncharged iPod. Tool produced by SCP. The iPod end of the charging cord, which needed no outside power source. Situation. A blank sheet of standard computer paper. Tool produced by SCP. A pen filled with a seemingly infinite supply of black ink. Situation. A Samsung cellular phone. Tool produced by SCP. A small device that when attached to the phone, increased signal strength by approximately 250%. Document number 117G. Developments concerning SCP-117. After exposing the SCP to an array of different items and people, it appears that the object may very well be sentient to some degree. Because of this, we must consider the fact that the SCP is susceptible to telepathy. It must not come into contact with any SCPs with known telepathic powers. Dr. Kleiman. The above was a transcript of the personal notes of Dr. Kleiman, who seems to have taken a harmless interest in the object. Testing with other SCPs is suspended. Note number 117-1. Testing is suggested for SCP-882 and is under consideration by Dr. Kleiman. Note number 117-2. Further biological testing is halted by Dr. Kleiman after incident number 117-4A. The SCP is still fit to be used for any repairs around the facilities, as long as the SCP is followed by one or more armed guards briefed on the proper use of the SCP. Note number 117-4. After much consideration, I must deny testing of SCP-117 with SCP-882. The risk of damaging SCP-882 is simply too great to overlook. Dr. Kleiman. Note number 117-26. After incident number 117-3F, I'm forced to put a stop to all testing of SCP-117 in conjunction with other SCPs. The risk of a total loss of containment is far too great. All biological testing is to be halted until a later date, as the results so far have proved varying, and there is a limit of Class D staff available for my research. Dr. Kleiman. Note number 11727. Biological testing resumed by Dr. Kleiman, with mixed results. Testing of SCP-117 with other SCPs under reconsideration by O5, though it seems unlikely further testing will occur. Note number 11728. Testing is suggested for SCP-682. Item number. SCP-148. Object class. Euclid. 
Special Containment Procedures Revision 3 SCP-148 is to be stored as 120 cast ingots, each of which weighs approximately 10 kilograms at time of writing. Ingots of SCP-148 may not be housed at the same site as any SCP, due to the potential for unforeseen interactions. Otherwise, said ingots should be distributed equally among acceptable Foundation facilities. The mass of each contained ingot of SCP-148 must be measured and reported monthly. Under no circumstances should any SCP with mind-affecting or extrasensory properties come into contact with SCP-148. In the event of such contact, the immediate area must be evacuated, and the affected sample of SCP-148 detonated remotely. Personnel are not to be assigned to SCP-148 for a period of time longer than three weeks. Any personnel assigned to SCP-148 are to be given regular psychological evaluations. Description: SCP-148 is a metallic substance, composed of a variety of known and unknown elements. The total mass of SCP-148 on hand is approximately 1.2 tons. SCP-148 has a gray-green color with a bluish tinge and oxidizes readily in the presence of water. SCP-148 has a melting transition point of approximately 4,500 degrees Celsius and a boiling transition point of approximately 9,000 degrees Celsius. SCP-148 has a density of 6.76 grams by cubic centimeters and qualifies as HRC-39 in a Rockwell hardness test. It exhibits material properties such as strength, ductility, and workability, similar to platinum. SCP-148 is composed primarily of platinum and iridium, the two composing 62% and 20% of its mass respectively. In addition, several other known metals are present in its composition, including iron, cobalt, and copper, which collectively makes up 16.5% of SCP-148's mass. However, given the mass of the material, it is believed that there are other substances not detectable by mass spectrometry or other means. Images of SCP-148 taken with a scanning tunneling microscope show gaps in its lattice that, under normal circumstances, would be filled with other materials. SCP-148 blocks or otherwise hinders extrasensory mind-affecting properties of living organisms in proximity to it. This effect, while difficult to quantify, appears inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the subject to SCP-148's surface and directly proportional to the quantity of SCP-148 in consideration. The range for which this effect is detectable is roughly 0.8 meters per kilogram of SCP-148. 1.1 tons of SCP-148 were retrieved from the Metallurgical Department of Prometheus Labs' base facility during the Foundation's sweep of the building. Documents concerned with the project had unveiled that the substance was to be subject to additional development, sold to an undisclosed buyer, trademarked, and sold as Telekill Alloy. However, due to and its political fallout, along with the destruction of the Prometheus Labs' base facility, it has acquired an estimated 1.3 tons of SCP-148 and sold it to unknown buyers. Foundation agents and forensic accountants are in the process of tracking the remaining supplies of SCP-148. Addendum 148-01 Due to its potential for use in containment of mind-affecting SCPs, SCP-148 has been approved for cross-testing with SCP objects. While tests are still in their early stages, tests with low-level anomalous items seem to indicate that SCP-148 will be an effective tool in containing said items. However, it does not appear to affect items whose notable properties are purely mimetic. Note, as of Incident 148-1, contact between SCP-148 and any mind-affecting items is strictly forbidden. Addendum 148-02 Beginning Staff reported irrational behavior and poor communication skills among janitorial staff tasked with regular maintenance of SCP-148's containment. At the time, containment consisted of a single storeroom, swept and checked on a daily basis. After three weeks of increasingly abnormal behavior, two custodians were taken in for questioning and examination. 
testing revealed that the aforementioned personnel were incapable of interpreting body language and did not appear to notice the intonation or phrasing of sentences. In addition, the affected subjects were incapable of determining the emotional state or intent of others and demonstrated severely limited vocabulary. Further testing has revealed that the language and communication skills of persons with regular contact or extended exposure to SCP-148 will, over time, deteriorate and disappear. It has been shown that, after eight weeks, affected subjects will be rendered completely mute and incapable of understanding or giving nonverbal requests, commands, or other statements, despite showing otherwise normal mental capacity. Addendum 148-03 a measurement taken several months after the Foundation's acquisition of SCP-148 indicated that, despite no increase in volume, SCP-148 has increased in mass by 0.1 tons, a density increase of 9%. The source of this additional mass is unknown. Incident Report 148-1 To test the limits of SCP-148's effects and its capacity to change in mass, 0.9 kilograms of it was placed on a scale and moved to SCP chamber. Predictably, SCP effect was nullified by SCP 148's presence. However, the sample of SCP 148 began to grow in mass by upwards of 5 grams per second. After one minute, this rate began to decrease, and SCP 148 ceased to increase in mass 40 seconds later, at which point, it weighed 1.4 kilograms. It remained at this mass for 8 seconds, before plummeting to 0.8 kilograms in the space of 2 seconds. During this time, personnel within 60 meters, 12 times the effective range of SCP began to experience said SCP's effects, albeit at a vastly increased rate, resulting in data expunged, locked down, until the affected subjects could be removed. Addendum 148-04 Measurements taken since Incident 148-1 indicate that the combined mass of SCP-148 is increasing at a rate of It is speculated that should a large quantity of SCP-148 undergo an event similar to the sample used in Experiment 148-1, data expunged, containment procedures are under review. Item Number SCP-157 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures When not being used in an experiment, SCP-157 is to be stored in its cryptobiotic form, in a dry, airtight container. It is estimated that SCP-157 can survive in this condition for at least 10 years. Specimens needed for experimentation can be removed from storage and given water then food to restore them to a usable state. Personnel working with an active SCP-157 colony are cautioned not to eat, drink, change clothing, or apply any substance to their body in the presence of SCP-157. Foundation MTF agents are authorized to administer Class A amnestics to any survivors or witnesses of wild SCP-157 attacks. Description. SCP-157 is a previously unknown microscopic animal in the tardigrade phylum, adapted to live on land as a predator. Like other tardigrades, SCP-157 is extremely resistant to environmental damage and can enter a cryptobiotic state when no food is present. SCP-157 normally exists as an amorphous mass composed of millions of individual organisms. In this form, it can slowly crawl and climb. SCP-157 colonies are predatory and can attack insects and small animals by engulfing them and then slowly dissolving their prey with digestive enzymes. Humans and other large prey are not normally attacked directly by SCP-157 colonies as they are too large to engulf and long-term contact is necessary for SCP-157 to successfully feed. The organism has developed an alternative method of achieving such contact. SCP-157 colonies possess an innate telepathic ability. When in the presence of prey that is too large to directly attack, the SCP-157 colony will use telepathy to present the illusion of something its prey wants to eat, wear, or apply to its body. 
SCP-157 is highly toxic when eaten. Someone having done so requires antidotes to and within 20 minutes, as well as immediate gastric surgery to remove the portion that was eaten. When applied to human or animal skin, SCP-157 will produce an anesthetic to encourage prey to ignore pain and leave the organism in place. It then dissolves and consumes the skin within 30 minutes to 2 hours. Dead prey is rapidly consumed, and SCP-157 will grow significantly as it feeds. When reaching a size of 5 kilograms, SCP-157 will split into smaller colonies that move off in search of new prey. When in the presence of two or more individuals, SCP-157 will have an inconsistent appearance. It may appear to be a food item to one person and an article of clothing to another. This can serve as a warning and prevent exposure to the organism. Addendum Note that due to its resilient nature, SCP-157 can be split into smaller pieces, boiled, microwaved, etc., and remain alive and dangerous. SCP-157 Capture Incidents Incident 157-01 Found with extensive scalp damage after mistaking SCP-157 for a bottle of shampoo and applying some to his hair. Victim was apparently immune to SCP-157's anesthetic and began screaming, attracting the attention of his wife, who had been eating a snack. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. He had a pastrami sandwich on his head, and it was eating him. Victim treated for chemical burns. SCP-157 captured alive. Victim and wife given Class A amnestics and released. Incident 157-02 Found partially consumed by SCP-157 in his office after apparently believing SCP-157 was a pair of socks and wearing them. Victim bled to death after feet and lower legs were mostly dissolved. Incident 157-03 Standard monitoring of police reports revealed a missing person's case where the investigating officers observed a couch, slowly attempting to crawl towards the door of the victim's apartment. Couch initially sealed in area by police. Foundation agents later determined it to be an unusually large variant of SCP-157 and contained the specimen. Amnestics administered. Although large enough to attack humans directly, this specimen prefers to use its telepathic ability to attract prey in the manner of smaller SCP-157 colonies. Item Number SCP-175 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-175 is to be kept in a metal safe when not undergoing testing. The safe is to be secured in a storage room at site with other low-maintenance SCPs. The room will be guarded by two security guards at all times in accordance with security protocol data expunged. Description When not active, SCP-175 resembles a yellowed piece of parchment, slightly larger than a standard piece of paper. The edges are torn, and it appears weathered and brittle. However, SCP-175 is actually quite supple and is indestructible, despite its worn appearance, having resisted all attempts to remove pieces for testing. The more interesting properties of SCP-175 are revealed when moved in relative proximity to a buried object. The proximity range seems to vary under unknown parameters. SCP-175 has become active in distances from as short as 30 meters to as far as several kilometers. However, on average, the distance ranges between 100 and 200 meters. When SCP-175 becomes active, its appearance changes to become either a map, a set of directions to the buried object, or some hybrid thereof. Though the approximate size and shape of SCP-175 remains constant, its appearance may change to resemble various other paper and parchment varieties, and the writing or drawing implement and style vary as well, seemingly based on the mindset of the individual or individuals who buried the object. If the buried object is dug up, or the map is removed from the proximity of the object, SCP-175 reverts back to its normal state. Document Number 175-08 Partial List of Barriers, Buried Objects, 
and appearances of SCP-175. All experiments took place at Data Expunged, unless otherwise stated. Dr. buried a wooden box. SCP-175 became a piece of graph paper with a pencil-drawn map of the surrounding area, complete with a legend in the bottom left. The location of the treasure was clearly marked. Dr. remarked that the handwriting on SCP-175 looked identical to his own. The five-year-old female child of said doctor was instructed to bury a wooden box with a couple of her toys in it. SCP-175 became a crayon-drawn map of the surrounding area on a white piece of paper, clearly modeled on the style of a normal child of that age. The ten-year-old male child of Agent was instructed to bury a box containing some of his comic books. SCP-175 became a list of instructions on lined yellow paper based on several landmarks in the area. Trees, rocks, etc. The instructions included where to start and how many paces to take to the next landmark, the direction to turn, and eventually, where to dig. The instructions were complete with misspellings appropriate for the knowledge of a child of that age. A well-respected professional landscape artist was instructed to bury an empty wooden box. SCP-175 became a canvas with an accurately painted overhead view of the surrounding area, with an X to mark the spot where the box was buried. A professional puzzle maker and crossword puzzle maker was instructed to bury a wooden box. SCP-175 became a piece of graph paper with several inked crossword and various other word puzzles, along with a meta puzzle. Solving the smaller puzzles was necessary to find the letters to solve the meta puzzle, which was a list of instructions for where to find the buried object. Agent who remembered a box with various objects that he had buried in his backyard at the age of eight, traveled with a research team to Data Expunged. SCP-175 became a pencil-drawn map of the surrounding area, along with labels that did not match his current handwriting, but did match his handwriting from papers his parents had kept that he had done at that age. Most remarkably, the map included several trees that had been cut down in the years since the box was buried. A D-Class personnel who had been a professional architect before his conviction as a serial killer was instructed to bury a wooden box. Data expunged. During transport of SCP-175, along with numerous other safe SCPs to Data expunged, one of the guards in the truck reported a high-pitched whine coming from the crate containing SCP-175. As per protocol, the truck was stopped and evacuated, and the nearest task force, Mobile Task Force Omega-7, Pandora's Box, was sent to investigate after being briefed on the contents of the crate. According to the debrief, they found a sheet of metal which was emitting the whine, and the sound increased in pitch and volume as they neared a specific location. Digging in this area uncovered SCP-1, at which point, the metal sheet reverted to the inactive state of SCP-175. Addendum 175-13 On a D-Class personnel who had been a professional architect prior to his conviction as a serial killer was instructed to bury a wooden box. The intended purpose of this experiment was to see what SCP-175 would look like when buried by an architect. When Dr. looked at SCP-175, once the box was buried, he immediately screamed, dropped to his knees, clutching his head with both hands, dropping SCP-175 to the ground, luckily face down. Agent who was standing by the side of said doctor during this experiment, reported a flickering mass of color and a sense of extreme nausea at a glimpse of SCP-175 before it drifted to the ground. He quickly dug up the box in order to reset SCP-175. Dr. went into a coma after this incident and intense psychological screening of the D-Class subject revealed a well-hidden schizophrenia and sociopathy. Since this experiment, strict protocol has been put in place to protect the mental health of researchers. Item Number SCP-182 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-182 is to be kept in a small, environmentally sealed structure on an otherwise uninhabited island, situated 10 kilometers off the coast of Greenland. 
a team of five guards are to be assigned to guard the subject at all times. Guards are to be examined for psychological damage once per month. Guards who show any signs of damage are to be recalled from their post and are required to undertake a full course of psychiatric therapy prior to returning to duty. No single individual is to spend more than six months at a stretch on 182 guard duty and are required to spend a minimum of three months on a different assignment before returning. Personnel are entitled to refuse this assignment if they have already spent a total of eight months or more on the island. SCP-182 is requested to be kept under heavy sedation for 20 hours per day. Following Incident 182-7, this privilege has been revoked. Description SCP-182 is a Caucasian male, of average build, roughly 45 years of age, and has suffered heavy abdominal and cranial scarring at an unspecified point in the past, by subject's own admission, shortly before he was admitted into the care of the Foundation in 19... SCP-182 is both deaf and mute, compensating for these disabilities with natural abilities. SCP-182 has displayed the ability to passively enter the minds of other animals, including humans, and to perceive sight and sound through their senses, in effect, riding as a passenger in their minds. This has no consistent effect on personnel, and some guards have rotated on and off on a regular basis for the past several years without detrimental effects. However, prolonged exposure to SCP-182's passive sensory borrowing results in vivid visual and auditory hallucinations in 97% of humans and 100% of non-human test subjects. The effects in question vary wildly in severity but continued exposure after the onset will inevitably result in mental collapse, with said mental breakdown being hastened by proximity to SCP-182. SCP-182 has displayed the ability to consciously force hallucinations upon his guards when under duress, and as such, it is advisable that subjects known to agitate SCP-182 be avoided, including mention of SCP-0762, SCP-682, and SCP-182's own past prior to acquisition by the Foundation. Termination of affected personnel is recommended if they cannot distinguish between the hallucinations and reality, as all subjects allowed to reach such a point have invariably broken down, with brain death or permanent catatonia being the only possible outcomes. SCP-182 cannot control this ability with any appreciable degree of skill and automatically sees and hears the perceptions of any living animals within 10 meters. Subject can focus on specific directions outside of that range, but cannot ride the senses of beings further away from it than 30 meters. SCP-182 additionally manifests the ability to project its thoughts into the mind of any individual whose senses it rides. This mental speech is the only known source of information about the subject and has been described by guards as akin to being spoken to by a small human between their ears. SCP-182 exhibits no mimetic or telepathic hazards stemming from this speech, though subjects report that his voice is always a component in their hallucinations. Addendum 182-1 SCP-182 claims that the incident that resulted in the loss of its speech and hearing also manifested its telepathic talents. It is not presently clear whether this was a deliberate goal of the torture subject was subjected to, or whether the apparently life-or-death situation caused previously suppressed powers to manifest. Questioning in this vein is to be discouraged, as SCP-182 has become agitated in the past, and has successfully attempted to accelerate the rate of mental breakdown in his handlers, resulting in numerous casualties during the first questioning. Addendum 182-2 it has been suggested that SCP-182 be used as a translator with other SCPs who appear capable of thought, but not of communication. Given the side effects of proximity to SCP-182, this request has been denied. Incident Report 182-7 Audio Report Recovered from Guardhouse Voice identified as Agent- Yeah. So. We got the letter this morning from 05 saying the sedation was approved. Dr. went out to tell 182. Guy seemed pretty happy, clapping his hands and everything. Like a little kid. Shot him up, he was out like a light. Slept a few hours, 
Then Dr. went in to check on him, make sure he was still breathing. Don't want a casualty, yeah? Anyway, I'm in the other house. We'd got up a good game of 21 when I hear Doc screaming his lungs out. Something about spiders or what? Following this, the tape records seven gunshots. Audio analysis indicates they were fired at a point above and to the left of the microphone. God damn it. We thought Doc had finally cracked. He'd been seeing little things out of the corner of his eye for a few days. We figured 182 had got to him. We drew straws to see who'd have to go and get his body. Agent J drew the short straw. Guy was fresh out here, just been assigned last week. Damn it. I should have gone instead. Jay's screams started a few minutes later. Everyone got up at this point. We started walking out there. Snow everywhere. Should have transferred out of here before- Ah! Another eight gunshots are heard, followed by repeated clicking. Subsequent sounds determined to be the replacement of an empty magazine. Ugh. These things. We got to the house where 182 was. He was lying on the bed, looked dead to the world. 30, maybe 35 feet away, Jay and Doc were sitting on the floor, drooling. Well, Doc was. Jay was dead. Blood oozing out of his mouth. Looked like he bit his own tongue off. All three of us knew what had happened. I started to see... things. I ran. I don't know about the other guys. I'm holed up in the building, gonna wait for the boat to arrive. Hope I can hold off long enough. Audio recording continued for 17 minutes. Intermittent screams and gunshots can be heard, as well as a door opening twice. I've seen what happens to those guys that go too far. I'm not ending up like that. I'm not going to see those things. Bye. A gunshot is heard. Tape records two hours of silence. The bodies of several agents were found inside the door, shot by Agent Said agent was found next to the recorder, a bullet lodged in his skull. Final Incident Report Subsequent questioning of SCP-182 by replacement personnel revealed that subject suffered from horrible, unworldly nightmares while sedated. Subject displayed elevated levels of stress during interview, and it is theorized that the nightmares experienced by SCP-182 caused enough emotional distress that subject unconsciously created a radius of heightened hallucinatory territory. Subject is henceforth to be denied all sleeping aids. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.